Super. Joel, thank you. The one person in the world that you don't want to follow uh, <laughs> is, is Joel Salatin. Uh, amazing talk. And you're probably also wondering why on earth a landscape architect is moderating a session on soil. Well, landscape is the relationship between humans and land. And it's, it's all to do with how the topography, the natural systems, the farming systems, the human systems fit together with where the woods are, where the hedgerows are, where the ponds are, and where the buildings are placed, and as new settlement happens, where that goes. And why is that important? Well, because actually that is the face of farming to the 80% of the urban population that Dita was talking about. That's what farming looks like to people, the 80% of people who don't really know what it is. And that's actually really important. I like Joel's um, optimism. I like Patrick's optimism. But actually what we need to remember is that in the First World War, farming and the countryside is what the propaganda was that we were fighting for. Since Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, Farming has not got a good press in the wider population. We need to be really aware of that. And part of the issue is beauty has been called natural beauty in the legislation. The one thing the British landscape is not is natural. It's farmed. And I think getting people to understand that farmed beauty is real beauty and practical beauty is where we need to go. And Michael Gove, when he started in his first speech, he put beauty and science in the same sentence. That was fantastic. Yesterday, he had a few hesitations. Um, he got the one moment in that very polished speech was where he said, uh, uh, and animals meet the end of their lives. Uh, he also talked about um, aesthetic value, not beauty. And I think where we need really to focus um, the understanding is why this landscape is beautiful, why people really emotionally connect with it. And, and we've got to bring science back into beauty. Talking to Joel over breakfast, um, we were, he pointed out this lovely fact that in the tropics, 60% of carbon and biomass is above the ground, and in the temperate climate, 60% is below the ground in the soil. And actually understanding that dynamic between places and climate and vegetation is, is crucial. I was born in the tropics, I grew up in the desert, and I've now come to rest on my grandfather's small holding on the South Downs. And it's, it's wonderful. And just understanding what is in that soil and where it goes is, is really important. And at the same time, with that urban population, understanding that wildlife is not wind in the willows, uh, and that it actually comes down to really fantastic micro organisms in the soil that make all of the health in the soil, give insects, which give life to the animals, which give life to the human gut. And I think that is the other angle of really reaching into the urban population, is understanding how human health is directly related to the microbial genome and the health in the soil. So I think I'm going to speak, I'm going to finish now because you've got the real experts coming on. But I think the, the two messages that we have to get across, and I thought the, the vegan question was a really important one, is the first, that you can't start with wolves and work backwards. You've got to start with the soil and work upwards. And the second is that you can't deal, concentrate on nature reserves and forget farming, because 70% of the land is farmed, and if we don't get that right, we don't get anything right. So I'm going to hand over now to a leading soil expert, Joel Williams, who is teaching from Australia to Africa to North America to Europe. And what he's got to say is extremely exciting.
Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you to Patrick and all of the team at uh, the Sustainable Food Trust. This has been an excellent, excellent event and very happy to be here. Um, we're going to talk soils. We're going to talk soil health particularly. And I think I would like, broadly speaking, to make the case that, uh, following on from some of the points that we just heard, that the time is ripe, that there is a soil health movement that is also underway, and that we, as an alternative food movement, have to get on board with the soil health movement and use it as a tool to drive change. And that is the case that I will uh, hope to make today. Starting with, uh, some of you may have come across this tool, Google Books, uh, you can plug in words and it will search through their database of millions of Google Books that they've digitized and, and show trends and patterns with words. Uh, it only goes up to 2008, starting at 1800, and you can see that soil health is something that is spiking right now, and if this could go through to 2018, it would only be going even higher. And this isn't also is not including any of the academic literature. If it was also bringing that in, it would be going higher again. There is a momentum happening. But what about healthy soil? Well, we've been thinking and talking and discussing healthy soil for quite a long time. So what is it that's changed? What is it that is changing? What is it about soil health that has captured the imagination of farmers, of consumers, of gardeners, of city folk, of rural folk. There is something there. Uh, I would like to make the case that I think that the soil health movement is our attempt to define what is healthy soil. We are now trying to define healthy soil, and that's what soil health is, I think. So what is healthy soil? What is soil health? It is a balance between these three things, and we've, we've all heard uh, the, this idea um, just before, and yes, I've got some Venn diagrams coming as well. Uh, I like Venn diagrams. Um, or three-legged stools, as we also discussed yesterday. It is chemistry, physics, and biology. And absolutely, it is the soil biology that is also one of the drivers of the soil health movement. It is this incredible vastness of the soil life, the living community, and its wonderment that has inspired the imagination of farmers and, again, gardeners, city folk. So it is this balance. They are all important. We have to think about them all. And then we have to think about how do we leverage this? Where can we get multiple outcomes, multiple benefits, bang for our buck? What is in the center of the Venn diagram? How do we focus on this to bring multiple benefits to the whole system? And I think Dieter touched on it lovely yesterday. Uh, we can be roughly correct or precisely wrong. And I think that although we may not know the exact answers, everyone's looking for soil health metrics and, and answers to what is healthy soil, self healthy soil. <laughs> We, we know that at least where we should be going in the right direction. And definitely, I would like to say that two of the important leverage points in the center there is, of course, soil organic carbon and diversity. And that is the case that I would like to make. Now, we're all interested in metrics of soil health. Here is a PhD that has just been advertised, that's just closed from Rothamsted looking at soil health metrics for sustainable farming systems with the goal to identify metrics that influence crop production and ecosystem services and determine these metrics for UK farmers to monitor soil health at a scale that is appropriate in field. This is a sign of things that is changing. This is exciting. This is three to four years away, though, before we start to answer this question. Another initiative, the AHDB Health, Soil Biology and Soil Health Partnership. This is a big funded project over five years that will produce lots of material about soil health and soil biology. And trying to define it and its metrics and how to measure and monitor, etc. Uh, I encourage you all to log on. There's some reports that have been released already. There's lots and lots of good reading here. But again, it is a sign that the waterfall, the trickles of that waterfall, we are moving in this direction. 
uh, lifting a few examples from some of these reports, trying to say, well, what is it about chemistry, physics, and biology that we should be looking at? What is it that is important? Well, there's quite a long list just on chemistry. Of course, it's nutrients, it's pH, it's organic carbon, all of these various things are, are what is being proposed that could be good to, to monitor the soul's chemistry, chemical health. Well, what about the soul's physical health? An even longer list of things we could be doing, looking at aggregates, of course, or structure, soul texture, porosity, infiltration. I mean, there's lots of metrics that we're also now trying to piece together. And we looked at biology and, of course, earthworms. We're all excited about earthworms as indicate, potential indicator species. Nematodes, soil insects, also can fulfill a very similar function. Everyone's excited about mycorrhizal fungi, of course. They are uh, fascinating organisms that can do extraordinary things to help us with sustainable production systems. And it is the, however, of all of those things, of course, it is the DNA and the molecular tools that we are now just tapping into the black box of soil biology that will be the next quantum leap in redefining our understanding of soils, how to work with soils. It is the genetic tools that are really going to rewrite the, the rule book here. But the point is that soil health has to integrate all of these things together. And that starts to get complicated and complex. And Patrick brought up the list of his metrics yesterday, just for plant health, which all equally looked uh, as messy. Now, and I, 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 all I have to say is that in the rush to find soil metrics, in the rush to quantify, in the rush, rush to find proxies, we're looking to funnel this vastness of information and ideas and metrics into something simple. And that is very valuable, and of course it is, and I fully support the need and the role to find simple metrics that we can look and measure on farm, and I fully support that. But I also have to say, we also have to be a little careful as we do that, because as we take complexity and try to simplify, we may lose out some of the minutia, some of the detail through that process. Uh, so I just, I think, it, in some regards, we don't, we should not shy away from complexity. We have to also embrace the complexity at the same time as funneling through into their simplicity. I think we have to do the two things at once. It is very important. I can give a good example. Justin, Justus von Liebig, the German chemist who discovered plant nutrients. Uh, he took plants, burnt them, measured the ash, and identified that NP were really important because they were present in large quantities in the plant. And off went the wheels of motion, NPK became the paradigm. He later came out and said, oh, there are also these trace elements, they are also very important for plant nutrition, but we went down this simplified model. And we've done the same thing here in the UK with our PH, PK, MG standard soil test, simplifying to four things. It's not that simple. We have to also embrace complexity at the same time as embracing simplicity. So how do we think about soil carbon? Okay, I, I'm not going to argue it is one of the leverage points. How do we build carbon? Uh, sure, again, we had a bit of debate yesterday. There is nuance. How do we measure carbon? Different te uh, techniques, uh, etc. different practices, uh, outcomes, of course. It has to be coupled with practice. Totally agree with some of that discussion yesterday. But broadly speaking, we do know at least how to be moving in the right direction. Okay, and to build soil carbon, we can either apply it, we can grow it, we also have to protect it, and then we also have to think about system redesign throughout all of that. So how do we apply carbon? It does what it says on the tin. It's things like compost, it's manure, biochar, it's mulch. We can apply carbon to help uh, build carbon. That is one strategy. A much more important strategy is growing carbon. Uh, of course, through the process of photosynthesis. That becomes critical, but of course we can do that through cash crops, yes, but it is also about cover crops, uh, intercrops, it's about more perennialization, moving uh, towards perennials, moving towards more fungal dominated, moving away from biological simplification. We have to get more perennials, more complex agroforestry. We can also grow some nitrogen through nitrogen fixation, and I'm going to say a few quick words on nitrogen as well after um, Manette's comments yesterday. Um, and we have to think about soil biology and the role of fungi, because they are particularly important in capturing the carbon that has been grown 
and converting that into forms that are very stable in the soil. It is fungi that are the true humus builders. It is them, and we have to understand their role within that soil food web community. Uh, we also have to protect soil carbon. And of course, that means with protecting the soil so the soil is not exposed, uh, and, and understanding the role of minimum till, of no-till, of minimizing soil disturbance, maintaining soil aggregates. It is those aggregates that hold carbon, and we have to maintain those as much as possible. If we do need some disturbance, I've called it intelligent disturbance, it's uh, being careful, it's uh, being planned, we also have to offset that disturbance, uh, counteract that disturbance by uh, implementing a strategy and a practice that also restores soil health at the same time as, as disturbing it. It's the year after year disturbing, disturbing, disturbing without offsetting, without counterbalancing that w is when we run into troubles. So, protecting, ma maintaining soil aggregates, protecting the soil is also an important piece of that puzzle. And then, of course, through all of that, we have to then think about this idea of redesigning the system. There are all of those practical practices, yes, but how do we also then integrate this in, as part of systemic solutions? And, okay, we've touched on some of these. We need more uh, diversity, more polyculture, and this is beginning simple things like companion cropping, relay cropping. It can be very a simple starting point, simply moving from one to two, moving from monoculture to a, a the beginnings of a polyculture. That is an important, actually, it's a one very small step, but a very important one, because it is the first step that then leads us to many other steps. And I would argue for that is an important space we need to focus our attentions. But it's things like also integrated nutrient management, combining organic and conventional nutrients together. Can we find a middle ground there? Of course, livestock reintegration, as we all know in this audience. Uh, breeding varieties, working with plants that are communicating more with the soil food web. Certain varieties that form these associations better with mycorrhizal fungi. Varieties that talk to soil microbes more. We have to look at those. And of course, grassland rotations and fertility building layers. The role of the fertility building layers within arable systems is absolutely a must. It's something we've got to be focusing on. And so again, I have to give another quick shout out to an ADAS, a new ADAS project, uh, Herbal Lane Network. They are trying to stimulate this conversation. They Google this one for if you are arable and you are interested in how to uh, conversations around lays in the arable systems. It's, they're just trying to build a network, it's looking at long-term rotations uh, and the impacts of that on soil quality, etc. Okay, these are good initiatives, these are initiatives that again are the sign that the trickle of change is coming. And it's important to understand the role of plants and the role of photosynthesis and the role of grasses in helping to build soil carbon. We know that, of course, plants photosynthesize and exude that carbon as root exudates down into the soil. And cereals uh, release 20 to 30 percent of that fixed carbon that they capture, gets exuded out and fed to those soil biology, those organisms, whereas pastures and grasses, uh, they release more. 30 to 50 percent of that carbon that they fix is exuded. And providing we have good biology around those root systems, particularly fungi, to capture those root exudates, they will convert them into stable human soil building carbon. So the role of grasses is important and therefore the role of photosynthesis is important, and therefore I make the case that on top of soil chemistry, physics and biology, that of course all influence plant growth, that through influencing plant growth, through influencing photosynthesis, photosynthetic capacity, and those root exudates that feed back down into the soil, that plant health is also has to be integrated into our understanding of soil health. They are one and the same, they go together, there is no soil without plants, no plants without soil. It has to look like this as well. And we have to move away from thinking about things like this. This is, uh, encapsulates exactly what is wrong with our line of thinking in our traditional production systems, because now I am saying that something is more important than the other. Nitrogen is of primary importance. They are all a level playing field. They are all of equal importance. It is this line of thinking that has led to the problems that we touched on yesterday with nitrogen uh, use efficiencies. 
and we had a comment from the audience. Here's one study. I, of course, slipped this slide in. Like there is a barometer. Uh, the same amount of nitrogen applied, same uh, units of nitrogen in from the bag or from uh, dairy manure, and then looking at a range of soil parameters and properties. And the study found that the soil respiration, the soil breathing, uh, and the soil enzyme activity, uh, so the microbes releasing various substances, which is we can use measure those to uh, gain an indice of their health, uh, was higher in the organically amended soil. And it's a very simple, simple idea. A picture explains it much better than I can. We can either apply the nutrient on its own, just by itself, highly volatile, highly leachable, highly prone to volatilization, or we can take that same uh, nitrogen and wrap it up with some carbon in the manure. Manure is not just nitrogen, of course, it's also got carbon attached to it. And when we attach carbon to nitrogen, we stabilize it. They are very, very different. They behave very differently. And this picture, I hope, explains that very clearly. But of course, we're obsessed about this idea when we have this ridiculousness of nitrogen in the air. Uh, 78,000 tons of nitrogen gas hovers above every single hectare. And yet we are obsessed that, and we are told that we need a couple of hundred kgs of nitrogen from the bag to produce a crop. 200 kgs of nitrogen from the bag, or 78,000 tons from the air. Okay, plants can't access this nitrogen. It is the microbes, it is the bacteria that can. And it is not just legumes and their rhizobium. There are many free-living nitrogen bacterial and fixing species that live around the roots of grasses, of herbs, of trees, of shrubs, of every plant around that root system of free living nitrogen fixes. This is something we should absolutely be tapping into. This is how we can help dial down these issues of nitrogen use, nitrogen use inefficiencies, and nitrogen leaching into our waterways. And there are many tools and strategies in which we can use to uh, access this, one of which among others is diversity, which brings me on to our next theme. And again, the picture says a thousand words, I really don't need to explain. You can see the benefits of those root systems, different root systems, depths, different root exudates that one species is releasing to the other, stimulating a different microbe, and they're all working together in collaboration, in partnership, and sharing those resources in the more biodiverse ecosystem. It's very, very clear. Here's another nice image of some different plant species and looking at the effects of their root exudates on the rhizosphere pH. The rhizosphere being that zone, that millimeter around the root system. So over on your left, we have fava beans, fava beans, spring beans. Uh, you can see they are releasing very acidic root exudates, driving the pH around that rhizosphere down into the acidic zone. Of course, that's why they do so wonderfully well in our alkaline high pH soils. Now in the middle we have soybeans, and over here on, the, uh, on your right uh, we have uh, maize. You can see that different plants will release different things to change the soil environment, that rhizosphere environment, to suit their growth, to suit their microbial partnerships, to help them grow. And this we need to foster and facilitate. When we build diversity, even just from one to two, and bring some fava beans with some maize, then we have a whole rhizosphere effect, a rhizosphere interaction happening, changing the soil dynamic, which is not being picked up in a traditional soil test. When we measure bulk soil pH, it's irrelevant to what is going on in this rhizosphere effect. And this is what diversity.